I don't know about you, and I don't think I'm alone in this. I love a good origin story. Does anybody else in here like an origin story? A movie or a book, right? I love a good origin story. There's something captivating about the beginning, the beginning of something, the moments that shape the narrative. They're captivating. They draw us in, and it allows us to have a deeper connection, maybe with a character or a civilization or whatever it may be that that origin story is about. But I've always been captivated by them. And for those of you who don't know, I'm a huge fan of Batman. Okay? Huge fan of Batman. Uh, Bentley and I, as Elizabeth and Stephen's son, we always argue over who the greatest superhero is. He likes Hulk, but I like Batman. And we always have a debate over who's the best. But I'm a fan of Batman. But it wasn't until about 2005 when Christopher Nolan and another writer came together to reboot the Batman franchise did we realize how desperately we needed an origin story for Batman. Batman Begins. We'd always seen and, and read and, and watched how Bruce Wayne's parents were, were shot, they were killed, but we never really got to see what made the man behind the mask tick. We really never got to understand it. And in the 2005 reboot, that whole scene, the backstory, really set a whole new tone for that movie that I believe fans of Batman appreciated. Um, it did something to that series. But as much as I like Batman, there is a greater ultimate origin story that I love dearly with all of my heart and soul, and that is the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is the greatest origin story ever written. And the thing about Genesis is it is a historical narrative. It is history. It is the origin of how all things came to be. It's the beginning of our Bible, the very beginning of God's Word to us. His self-revelation of Himself to us is in the book of Genesis. It records the beginning of all things, of the universe. My question to you is, well, then who wrote it? I don't know any human being that was there in the beginning. Who wrote this book, this origin story of humanity and of the universe. Genesis's author is anonymous. It doesn't tell us who the author is, but if we survey our scripture and the Bible, the New Testament and the Old Testament attribute authorship to Moses. We see it clearly. Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. He is the author here in Genesis. You know, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1 attributes this to Moses. You go to the Gospels. Jesus, uh, through the Gospels, attributes Genesis to Moses. And so we know Moses is the author of this book. And Moses, we have to remember, he is writing to the people of Israel that he is leading out of slavery from Egypt into the promised land. Mo Moses is writing to those people who were held captive in, in Egypt. And imagine what encouragement, inspiration these original readers would have received by having an origin story, a book of their beginnings. To the people in Israel, they highly valued this book. It told them about their people. It told them about the origin, their journeys, their, the covenants that God made. We learned in Sunday school today, they connect very well, that God made promises. And when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, Moses like, here I am. And God identifies himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. And he, he does that so that he can tell Moses, this is who I am. I am the very God that you know about, that you've read about. And then so Moses, through the inspiration of God, pins these words. The original audience were the nation of Israel. And we have a story of redemption through the book of Genesis. Now, for original readers, later readers, I mean, of us, Genesis offers a very thorough background of the entire Bible. If you disregard Genesis, you miss crucial, crucial teachings about who God is. You miss crucial doctrine that helps us in our lives and our understanding of Scripture. You remove Genesis, then there are quotes from Genesis throughout the New Testament and allusions to it. Genesis is a very important book in this series. I'm excited about it. 
It's important. It lays the foundation for our understanding on the most important issues of life. Questions that we all have. The first three chapters of Genesis, we find answers to basic questions like, Who am I? How did I get here? Where did the world come from? Who created the universe, the stars, the solar system? How did all of that come to be? What's wrong with the world? What's wrong with me? Who is God? What is sin? What is good and evil and right? What is a family? What is marriage? What is the role of a husband? What is the role of a wife? All these questions Genesis answers with clarity. Philosophers and great minds have spent a lot of time and resources trying to give us answers to these questions, and they have failed. Genesis is crystal clear on the origin of all things. And the way that it begins is so dramatic, and we're immediately, when we approach Genesis, if we could picture ourselves like walking up to someone's home, and they open the door for us. As soon as the book of the first page of Scripture is open to us, who do we meet but God? God gives a self-revelation of Himself. The only verses we're going to be able to get to this morning are the first two. Okay? And it was almost just the first verse. And so we're going to try to get to verse 2 today. Because, and no pun intended, there is a universe of truth just in those first two verses. And we need to stop and pause and see the revelation of God that He gives us in His Word of just who He is. You see, we're taking a literal interpretation of Genesis. Moses, as the author, he's not concerned with, is there a God? He doesn't, he's not concerned with proving the existence or defending the existence of God. He simply declares God. God existed. God existed. God created. Moses proclaims that. And so we are going to take that same approach as well. And so we're going to look at these two verses, and I pray that God would give us all that He intends for us to have in this period, in the life of our church, and in our individual lives as Christians. And so let's read the beginning of the origin story of all things. The two verses. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep, or over the waters. Do you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you today, in your word, Father, we pray for you to speak to our hearts. Father, as we handle the origin story of all things, you reveal yourself and may we see you clearly in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. 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 So I want you to see first the creator of the universe. We're introduced to him right off the bat, God's self-revelation of himself. We read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is a summary statement for what follows from verses 2 on. It's a summary statement. Beautiful. I wish I could write something so concise that captures everything in something that short. But here, you've got, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Look with me, if you will. The focus in that verse isn't on anything. Yes, we have the heavens, we have the earth, we have the beginning. But the main focus in that verse is on who? It is on God. The main focus is on God. And just like I said a moment ago, Moses is not concerned with proving the existence of God. Genesis does not seek to answer the question, is there a God? Genesis seeks to answer the question, who is God? And that is the question we're going to consider today. Who is God? God, as we see, is the beginning. He's the source and the initiator of creation. And so God, through Moses, reveals himself to us, the origin story we see, begins with God. And so who is this God that created all things? And what's interesting, when you look at the word God, Moses doesn't use the Hebrew name Yahweh or Jehovah. 
He doesn't use those names. Those names are frequently used. We talked about them this morning in Sunday school. They're frequently used in the Old Testament. Moses doesn't use that name for God here in Genesis 1.1. Well, what name does he use? Because we know through Scripture a name means something. Our sermon series leading up to Christmas, we saw how important names, what they meant. They represent a reality. The same thing here with God's name. It's not Jehovah. It's not Yahweh. The name that Moses penned through the inspiration of God was the name Elohim. He uses the name Elohim. El, E-L, meaning God, and the ending makes it plural, gods. Now, we know that there's only one God, the Father, and so this is what is referred to as the majestic plural. What it is doing whenever Moses says Elohim created, he's intensifying our understanding of who God is. Moses is emphasizing the power and the majesty of God. So when he says Elohim created, what he is saying is the mighty one, the one who possesses all power, the Lord God Almighty, the Almighty One created. He is the source and the possessor of all power. This is the Almighty One. Now, if you wanted to see it, it is in the plural form. It could be hinting at the Godhead, the, the triune God, the Trinitarian nature of the Lord, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's not a far-fetched assumption because we know that in the pages of Scripture, we learn that all persons of the Godhead were present and active in creation. Take, for instance, God the Father in Acts chapter 4, verse 24. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So God the Father was active. He was present, but so was the Son. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Colossians, we read about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. So the Son was present there at creation and an active part of creation. But so was the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1, chapter 2, that the Spirit of God was there hovering over the face of the deep. But even in the Psalms, we read in Psalm 104, 30, when you send forth your spirit, they are created. And so the spirit was present and active. So Elohim, God the Almighty, God in three persons. God was there. God created. And Moses declares, and this may sound like an elementary sentence, but God, Elohim, is the creator of the universe. He is the creator of the universe. And as we understand that wonderful, just wonderful proclamation that Moses gives us, if we allow ourselves to ponder that statement, that God is the creator of the universe, and we understand he's, it's Elohim created the universe, we see certain characteristics and the nature of God just in a statement and a proclamation like that here in the very beginning of the Bible. Because God chose to use that name in the beginning. He chose to use that name when we open the door of Scripture. That's who we meet is Elohim, the Almighty One. Well, as the Creator, who is He? As the Creator, what, what can we know about God? And the first thing I want you to see is that as the Creator, God is eternal. As the Creator, God is eternal. Notice in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. This is not a beginning of God. Genesis isn't the origin of God. You and I have an origin. We have a starting point. 
God has always existed. God is unlike us in the sense that he doesn't have an origin story. God always was. He always existed. And so when Moses writes the words, in the beginning, he is referring to the beginning of all that we know, the creation of the universe, the creation of humanity. So in the beginning of God's creation is what he's referring to. The universe, as some scientists and some people believe, is eternal. The universe is not eternal. God and God alone is eternal. And Moses understood that truth. You, don't even, you can go outside the book of Genesis to understand that Moses got that. He wrote a psalm. Moses wrote Psalm 90. And in verse 2, Moses writes, Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, or from eternity to eternity, you are God. And remember, God in three persons. So Jesus is co-eternal with God. The Holy Spirit is co-eternal with God. Jesus doesn't have an origin story. Why? Because he was with God the Father before time began. The Holy Spirit was with God the Father before time began. So they are co-eternal. God is eternal. And since God is eternal, He is self-existent, self-satisfied. There is nothing that God needs. God doesn't need anything. And that is what is magnificent about the creation account, is that God, by His own will, chose to create. And He chose to create so that we could see His greatness. We use the word awesome. You ever use that word, awesome? Sometimes we use it so loosely, but that is really a word that should be reserved for the Lord because what he did here in Genesis was awesome. And it is meant for us to see his awesomeness, his greatness, so that he receives worship for his creation and from his creation. He is eternal. He doesn't need anything, but he chose to create. And through his creation act, we also see His grace. He didn't have to do it, but He did. God is eternal. And something about God being eternal, and this is hard for our minds to really wrap, a, wrap around, you know, because we want to read it as, oh, in the beginning, this is, this is God's starting point. But God exists outside of time and space. In the beginning, God created, and so He exists outside of time and space. How can we understand it? The only way I can try to describe it to you is if you take this pew up here and you write the pew, you can see it. So you have a starting point right here. So you could say, that's the beginning of the pew. That's the end of the pew. When you were born, you were born, and then you're going to die. You have a starting and a beginning. God does not exist right down here in all of that. God exists outside of here, all of the way over here. And he can see it from beginning to end because he is transcendent. He is above it all. And so God came into time and created it in the beginning of creation. So when God, that, that's why God is not constrained by time as we are. That's all we know. All we know is a beginning and an end. But God always existed in eternity past. And so as the creator, he is eternal. And as the creator, he is also all-powerful. We use the word omnipotent. God is omnipotent. He has all power. Look with me again. In the beginning, God, what? <coughs> created. That is the word barach in Hebrew. God created. And the usage here isn't that simply that God made something, but that God created out of nothing. There was nothing there, and the Almighty One, Elohim, created out of nothing all that we see and know. For example, I used to use this illustration. Now, okay, I had to run across the parking lot a minute ago because I forgot to get it from the office. I have building blocks here, okay? I have some building blocks. Now, scientists and some people will tell you, oh, this is great, it's, this is the box that wasn't open. All right, so the scientists and people are going to tell you that 
one option when you approach creation is that material always existed. Matter always existed. This universe always existed. But if I wanted to build a structure, right? So I'm going to pour this in, in this bag. All these blocks, okay? And we're going to pretend, right? Okay, so all of this matter, all of these things existed from eternity. That they didn't have a starting point, okay? And so at some point, billions and millions of years ago, all of this matter that was pre-existing just kind of come together and it built this beautiful structure, right? You can't take all these blocks and just shake them. I want to build a great structure. We have some architects in here. Does that work? Right? I would fail. Matter is not eternal. Another belief is, okay... There was one point there was nothing. And then it, matter was spontaneous. So at one point there was nothing, then all of a sudden it was. Which leads you back to the shaking the bag theory of building a structure. And I've used this illustration before. I've seen it done with Legos too, and I've done that. Is to build a structure takes intelligent design. It takes somebody to take the blocks, right, and build. What I didn't know at the time when I was younger is that that illustration is faulty too. Because I said, I'm going to take these, and God is like, you know, he's building this structure. He builds this figure. He builds it. But I can't even do the illustration. Why? Because this is pre-existing. Right? This is pre-existing. I'm using materials that already exist. God, there was nothing. God spoke it into existence. So three options. Either the universe is eternal or it's spontaneous or there's somebody who exists outside of time and space that spoke everything into existence and has a reason. He is the first cause, the initiator. And you all laugh, but people believe that. They believe that it just came to be. You ask a child, any child, if they see a structure or something, they know somebody built that thing. And they can tell you that there is a creator. Why we struggle with that so much? You know... The first verse in the Bible, in the beginning God creates a problem for some people because we have a problem with supernatural God doing supernatural things that blows our mind. But here in the beginning we see an eternal God, we see an all-powerful God. You know, in school they taught us that zero times zero equals what? Zero. Nothing times nothing equals nothing. So how can nothing become something unless something did something to the nothing, right? That makes sense. You can quote that. Put it on Facebook. (laughs) But how can that happen? But only a powerful, omnipotent God, Elohim, creator of the universe. A.W. Pink, love what he says, quote, Before man can work, he must have both tools and materials. But God began with nothing, and by his word alone, out of nothing, made all things. And as the creator, God is all-powerful. Jeremiah, he says, It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding he has stretched out the heavens, Jeremiah says. He goes on in chapter 32 and verse 17 to say, O Lord God, you yourself made the heavens and the earth by your great power, and with your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you, Jeremiah states. In Hebrews, in chapter 1, we read that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of His nature, sustaining all things by the power of His Word. And even there we have another picture of God. So if God is eternal and He's all-powerful, God is... He sustains all things. He doesn't just create it and let it be on its own. God creates and God sustains everything by the power of His Word. God is all-powerful. There is no one, no thing that can ever overpower God. There's not. There will never be anything too difficult for the Lord to accomplish. He can do all things. He can do anything at any time for any reason off of His will because He is Elohim, the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the universe. Amen? Amen. He's eternal. He is all power and as creator because he is all powerful he's eternal he's the one that started it all 
means that he has all authority. He has all authority. Psalm 89, the psalmist declares in verse 11 and 12, the heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all it contains, you have founded them. And so as the founder, as the creator, as the one in authority, he is God Almighty. Authority belongs to him. God and God alone establishes boundaries. He's the one that determines boundaries. He's the one that determines what good and evil is. He determines what, what it looks like when a person sins, what the consequences are, I mean. God determines the consequences because He is the creator of all things. So therefore, He has authority over all things. He is sovereign. So if He creates something good and perfect and has a, an intention, this is how to carry this out, and it doesn't happen in the order that God created it, then God has to be just to His nature, and God determines consequences. And what is amazing in my head to think of, you, of these points is, in eternity past, there was a divine blueprint of creation that was already on God's mind. He didn't need to create it, but he decided and chose to create. And as he was already creating, back in eternity past, he already had a plan for redemption. He knew what was going to happen. He allowed it to happen. And don't focus so much on, well, why did he go through all this trouble and he knew this. God is God. God knew, but God wanted to show his greatness, his awesomeness. He wanted to show who he is so that he could be worshipped. And so that people could see that he is a redeemer, a sustainer, the eternal creator of all things. Not this deism to where God created and wound up a clock and, and, and stepped back, as you see in verse 2 in a moment. God is intimately involved in his creation. And he has always been involved in his creation as he sustains it. If you're paying attention, say amen. amen. Thank you. As the creator, the eternal nature of God, the one who is all-powerful, the one who has all authority is also worthy of our worship. And we read out of Revelation chapter 4 just a moment ago, but I'm going to do it again because you, you take this in and allow your minds to truly ponder those truths just in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We see so much of His nature there. And we understand it, we understand that He is worthy of all worship. Revelation 4, the throne room of heaven. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. Whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, this is beautiful, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. God is worthy of our worship. Now, We've seen the creator of the universe and I challenge you as you go through this week to ponder those truths because those truths are going to inform the rest of our understanding of Genesis and really our understanding of Scripture at all. You can't run away from the creation. Say, well, I'm not going to believe Genesis. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to form my belief and try to make God fit in with all of these things, a gap theory. Oh, I can go all over the place with that and I won't. We can do all of these things to try to run away from Genesis, but you can't. You go to Exodus, he's there. The, the book of the law, he's there. You go to uh, the wisdom books, you go to Job, you go to Psalms, he's there. The creation account is there. You go to the prophets, he's there. You go to the New Testament and the Gospels, the creation account is there. You go to Acts, church history, he's, the creation is there. Specifically even in Acts chapter 4 and 17 when Paul's in Athens. Then you go to the epistles. He's in the epistles. He's in Romans. He's in Corinthians. He's in Colossians. And you go to the very last book. Well, maybe if I can run to the very end of the Bible. You can't. In Revelation, it's there. We just read it. 
this part. There are many more verses. From beginning to end, the Bible testifies that God is the creator. As creator, he's eternal, all-powerful, has all authority. He's worthy of our worship. And in closing today, I want our minds to focus and consider then the condition of the earth in verse 2. The condition of the earth. Now, when I say the condition of the earth, I'm talking about its primordial state. At its very beginning, at its initial time that when God created, um, we don't know what it looked like. There was not a gap. God spoke universe, okay, and it was created. Now, I want you to picture this with me. Because people will say, oh, millions of years between verses 2 and 3, God created almost like if you think of an artist and they're painting a picture. They start with a blank canvas, right? And they have their palette that has all the different paints, or oils or whatever on that palette. God is, he's got all the raw materials. He created it. And now he begins to fashion it and form it from verses 2 on as a great masterpiece of his creation. And he does it immediately, and he does it over the course of six days, as we're going to see in the coming weeks. God is meticulous, he's involved, and he paints this beautiful masterpiece, and he creates it. Because at this time, there was no stars. It was just the universe and this earth. And so what was the condition of the earth? Verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So we see that the earth was lifeless. In its primordial state, it was empty, it was desolate, it was barren. It's a wasteland. Maybe your translation says wasteland. It was uninhabited, it was uninhabitable. There was no life. We also see that it was engulfed in darkness. There was no light created yet. God hadn't spoken it into existence. And so it was engulfed in darkness. And it was also submerged in deep waters. God started with a vital element of water to create the world. And water covered the face of the deep, of the, of the earth. But it was dark. It was lifeless, uninhabited, and uninhabitable. But notice the second part of verse 2. The Spirit of God was there, hovering over the waters. Now, what in the world was the Spirit of God doing? The Spirit of God was ready to act off of the word of the Father to start creation. And all this happens like this. That when God speaks it, it happens. The Spirit of God hovering over the water. The picture really is um, of a mother eagle stirring up her nest. You see it in Deuteronomy. The same word that's used. So the picture is this mother eagle stirring up her nest, fluttering over the young to bring what is immature into more active life. And that is what we see through the creation account. You go to verse 3. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then God said, and it was so. And we'll see that in the coming weeks. With the Spirit of God hovering, protecting, guarding, ready to act and ready to create off of the Master's words of how the creation was to look and how it was to be. I want to use this as a closing point for a reason. Because if you are a Christian, okay, before you yielded your life to Christ, before you surrendered to His Lordship and received Him as Lord, you were very much like the primordial state of the earth, if you think about it. You were lifeless, spiritually. You were uninhabited by the presence of God. You were lifeless, barren, empty. You were also engulfed in darkness, spiritual darkness, blinded by the devil, the Bible tells us. Unable to see the truth. You're also drowning as well. Instead of drowning in water, you are drowning in the depths of sin. And so you're lifeless, you're engulfed in darkness, submerged in deep waters. Don't miss this. But the Spirit of God, through the Word, through what Christ did, right? You got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all involved in your salvation, by the way. But the Spirit of God hovered over you. When the word was planted within your heart, convicting you of sin, bringing you to life. Ephesians tells us very clearly, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, right? Made us alive in Christ. 
We were dead in trespasses. And the Bible tells us that you are saved by grace. That you were convicted of your sin through the work of the Holy Spirit. You received Christ and became a new creation. The Bible says the old is gone, the new has come. Every single person on the face of the earth is in need of a new creation. If you are a Christian, you experienced your rebirth. You're being born again. You are a new creation. How did that happen? Was it because you did something? No, it was because Elohim, God Almighty, had sent His Son to do the work that we could never do, taking His perfection to the cross, dying, being buried in the grave, and rising victoriously over death, sin, and the devil. And God, through the Holy Spirit, sent the Spirit to convict you of those truths and to bring you from a state of spiritual death to a state of spiritual life. There in the very beginning, we see our God clearly. The one who created all things and by whom all things exist and have their place, right? And if you don't know Jesus, if you've never surrendered to him, just this is your condition now. Is how the Bible describes it. You're dead in trespasses and sins, but if you want to go to Genesis and use the language, you are lifeless. Your darkness is covering you. You're in need of a new creation that only God can provide. Genesis starts the story of redemption. And we're going to get there in the coming weeks. I hope that this is a series that we can really just settle into and take it piece by piece because there's so much truth for our lives and for our church in these verses. Seeing God as the Almighty One, the Eternal One. And understanding that nothing is too difficult for God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created all things. And next week we're going to get to see the details of how He created, how He did it is what we're going to see next week. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time today. We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, that you are the Almighty One, the one who possesses all power, who's not bound by time or space, the one, Lord, that there is nothing too difficult for. You can save the most hard-hearted, stubborn person. You can create them anew. Nothing is too difficult for you. <coughs> help us to see these truths as Christians, Lord. Help us to praise and worship you of who you are. Being reminded of who you are, Lord, helps give us direction for our life. That we can trust you at your word. I pray for each person here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.